Association of Academicians for Peace, a permanent project of the Universal Peace Federation International involving academics and educators who pursue peace. UPF was founded in 2005 by the Reverend Dr. Sun Myung Moon and his wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, as a forum to serve, uh, to support, uh, serve and support the United Nations mission as a private NGO in its search for true and lasting peace throughout the world. In this capacity, we have convened thousands of conferences, symposia, and other gatherings throughout the world over the past 17 years of our existence. Always the objective has been to bring together parties with sometimes opposing views for the purpose of getting to know one another's points of view. That singular effort has led to the establishment of eight specific areas of human interest, including assembling heads of state and government, parliamentarians, religious leaders, business leaders, media leaders, academicians, women leaders, and leaders in the arts and the cult and culture. Our session today centers around the theme, the role of academicians in bringing peace to the Korean Peninsula. It's a difficult enough task to, to achieve peace in a single household. So our task is indeed a great one. We're fortunate to have a very distinguished group of presenters today, each with a substantial history of experiences with the DPRK and its people. This session will be conducted principally in English, but as you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a button called interpretation, which allows you to select the language of your choice. Each, uh, each of the uh, speakers is fluent in Korean language, I believe, and this lends itself to the prospect of a very fruitful exchange among them. I just wanna point out that uh, the three languages uh, that are uh, have interpretation today are English, French, and Russian. So our Russian friends can uh, scroll down to the Russian button and hear all the, the presentations in Russian. <clears throat> We've also tried to design this session in a way to give voice to those whose experiences created bonds of friendship and affection with kin and co-workers or colleagues in the northern part of Korea. These bonds allow the voices of those in the north who also wished for peace and normalcy to be reflected by our speakers here today. So I'll refrain from giving a homily about, about peace this morning and simply introduce the first of the two main speakers for our session and we'll proceed from there. I would ask that the presenters keep to the 10 minute maximum and respondents to an approximately six minute maximum, which will allow for 20 to 30 minutes of interactive exchange among our speakers and possibly a question or two from the audience. I would like to thank all of you who have joined us today, either directly on Zoom or through YouTube and Facebook where we are live streaming. So without further ado, I'd it gives me great pleasure to invite all our listeners, listeners to join with me in welcoming our speakers and panelists for our session. Thank you all for being with us today. Now let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Felix Kim is a retired doctor of medicines, medical sciences and former chief surgeon at the Doma de Dovo Hospital in Moscow. He is also president of the NGO named International Union of Korean Political Organizations of Russia to Promote Peaceful Unification of Korea, or Bamin Ryong in Korean, which is a pro-North Korean organization. Dr. Kim was a participant and one of the active organizers of the Russia-Korea Motor Rally in 2014, which made its way from Moscow all the way to Busan and which was dedicated to the 150 year anniversary of the resettlement of Koreans into Russia, mainly to the Primorsky Krai area, I believe. We are eager to hear your views on North-South unification from a somewhat different paradigm than we're used to hearing from many of our Western prognosticators, Dr. Kim. And so I, I offer the floor to you at this time. The floor is yours, sir. Добрый вечер, дорогие друзья. Приятно и ответственно участвовать на таком на вебинаре по такой тематике. Вклад ученых на мир в Корейском полуострове. Это очень животрепещущий вопрос. Исторически э -э 
Корея, Корейский полуостров был освобожден э, советской армией совместно с партизанами вождя Ким Ир Сена. Американцы же вступили на, на землю Корейского полуострова, не сделав ни одного выстрела против японской армии. И вот это, вступив на землю э, Кореи, американская армия осталась на долгие 75 лет и не собирается уходить с нашей земли. Э, говорить о мире на Корейском полуострове, об объединении страны, Вось Ким Ир Сен э, предложил три хартии. Это мирное объединение, добровольное объединение и объединение на основе общенациональной консолидации. Только на таких условиях могла бы Корея объединиться. Далее в процессе значит, э, дальнейшей работы он выдвинул теорию э, создания конфедеративной демократической республики Кореи, где бы север и юг в экономическом плане работали бы каждый по своей системе, а в общенациональном плане как единое государство в международных делах. Ну вот, после предложения этой э, темы прошло уже больше 40 лет, но тем не менее каждый трактует об объединении по своему. Много э, в течение многих этих лет между Севером и Югом были разные периоды. То э, периоды значит, взаимного доверия, потом э, были периоды взаимного ну, как бы сказать, не, не до понимания, я бы сказал. Были периоды, когда Ким э, Ченнер, и Ким Тэ Джун, и Но Мэн Хён, э, были такие э, встречи с такими декларациями, что, казалось бы, вот-вот э, настанет объединение Кореи и единое государство. Но это, к сожалению, э, осталось в прошлом. По поводу того, что наш вождь Ким Ильсен, он как-то всегда, я вот с детства в Советском Союзе услышал его пословицу, которую он высказал, что человек без родины – это подобен бездомной собаке. Это его высказывание наложило на меня очень-очень глубокий отпечаток. И вот по роду, ну, как, изучая, значит, э, деяния Ким Сена по возможности в Советском Союзе, я как-то в конце, начало, в конце, нет, начало 90-х был, ну, как бы, произошли в России исторические кардинальные события, которые как наш президент Владимир Владимирович Путин высказал, это была катастрофа международная. В 1991 году развалился э, Советский Союз. В 1991 году, однако, произошли э, два, я бы сказал, эпохальные события. Э, Горбачев, Горбачев, который был предателем Родины, который разрушил коммунистическую партию практически, принял в Кремле пастора Мунсонлена, который славился на весь мир своим антикоммунистическим э, взглядом. И в этом же году Мунсон Нена, пастора, принял великий вождь Северной Кореи Ким Ирсен. 
все были ну, в недоумении, потому что э, Ким Ир Син знал, что Мун Сон Ён это ярый антикоммунист. До этого, до этого у вождя как-то спрашивали, почему вот, э, в Советском Союзе церковь э, была отделена от государства, и все работники религии преследовались э, коммунистами. А Кимирсен просто ответил, а за что я буду ругать, преследовать священнослужителей, если они молятся об освобождении Родины, об объединении и освобождении Родины. Не за что, пусть они молятся. И вот произошла встреча, когда встретились, я бы сказал, два величайших патриота. Это великий войск Кимирсен и пастор Мунсон они встретились с таким, я бы сказал, с такой теплотой друг другу. Они оба патриоты, патриоты Кореи. И вот они нашли между собой очень много общего. Был очень задушевный, теплые встречи, разговоры. И в конце концов они даже побратались. Мунсон Мен назвал Ким Сына старшим братом. И вот это плат Мунсон Мена, я бы сказал, дело обмения Родины в единое государство считается огромным. Это придерживается и нынешний, нынешний верховный руководитель Ким Чен Ын. Вот. Я да, кроме этой послуги, я бы хотел повторить для людей исторически. Марк Аврели, интересно, император Рима, философ, он как-то высказался человеку, гражданину, помимо материального, духовного благополучия, нужно э, славное Отечество, которым он мог бы гордиться. И действительно, в те времена любой римлянин мог высказаться другому иногда варвару, не трой меня, я римлянин, так гордо звучало звание римлянина. Вот. А у нас в России, в Российской империи, был министр внутренних дел Столыпин Петр Аркадьевич. Не менее он вот, его слова мне тоже очень нравятся. А, народ не имеющий национального самосознания, есть навоз, на котором будут расти другие народы. Понимаете, история э, носит э, цикличный характер, спиралевидный. И вот как бы столько лет не прошло, а высказывание великих имеет свою цену. Я вот в отношении, на отношении севера юга э, вот когда э, Мунтин стал э, после э, э, президентства Кюхи э, президентом, у нас по, тоже опять появилась надежда о воссоединении э, Родины. Но опять ну, не дадут американцы соединиться э, Южная и Северная Корея в одно целое. Потому что это им невыгодно. В мире, в мире существует три государства. Посчитайте. Это Германия, Япония и вот Южная Корея. Южная Корея, или не в эти три государства, американские войска вошли в 1945 году. И с тех пор не уходят. Разными предлогами всякими они не уходят. И эти страны до сих пор остаются оккупированы. Мне иногда кажется, надо американским э, войскам напомнить нашу старую пословицу. В гостях хорошо, а дома лучше. Подумайте над этим. Спасибо за внимание.
Well, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Kim, for expressing your views, the views of uh, uh, people from the north of Korea, the DPRK and the leadership. The issue of sovereignty is certainly a valid one. Uh, Koreans must be masters of their own fate. Um, and you, you mentioned that patriotism is, uh, is what brought uh, Chairman Kim and Reverend Moon together. Um, I also like the idea of confederation that you mentioned in your, your written remarks um, of the two states that uh, Chairman King and uh, Kim and Reverend Moon uh, uh, shared. <clears throat> and that was interesting to me as a Canadian because uh, I'm living in a confederation here uh, uh, of Canada, uh, confederation of provinces and territories spread across an entire continent. So thank you very much again for your remarks, a very important remark. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn next uh, to my friend, American friend, Dr. Alexander Mansarov. Fascinating heritage as a son of the Soviet Union includes his grandfather spending many years in Siberia, thanks to the beneficence of Uncle Joe Stalin. Um, after studying in Moscow, he continued his education at the Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang and subsequently earned his doctoral degree at Columbia University in New York. Currently, he teaches advanced security studies in, at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And there's <coughs> much more I could say, but Dr. Mansarov, your turn to speak. The floor is yours, sir. Welcome. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening, uh, our audience in Korea. Good afternoon, our audience in Europe. Uh, it's my privilege to be a part of this very noble effort uh, by the Washington Times family. Uh, now, it is my honor to contribute to the noble mission of the U Universal Peace Federation and the Global Think Tank 2022, together with other distinguished guest speakers. Uh, before I begin, let me say that I'm really grateful uh, uh, for the fact that uh, when pandemic closes uh, the borders between uh, our countries, uh, uh, Dr. Hakcha Hanmun, she opens them up via these virtual exchanges, virtual webinars, and I'm grateful to her for that. I'm also grateful to Mother Moon uh, for the fact that uh, when racial conflicts, when ethnic and social tensions, when gender biases deepen and divide us, Mother Moon sets the example of diverse, equitable, and inclusive policies uh, through her projects. And finally, I'm grateful to Mother Moon for the fact that when people lose their jobs, and here in the United States, the situation is, I guess, as difficult as many other countries around the world on that front, uh, the Moon family creates jobs and helps uh, to raise the living standards of people around the world. And so I'm grateful to her for that as well. Now, uh, specifically, I was asked to talk about uh, the role of academicians in uh, dealing with what is uh, uh, known as the demonization, demonization of uh, uh, our enemies and specifically a country like North Korea, as you know, the relationship between North Korea and uh, the United States, Japan, South Korea, some other countries uh, has been, uh, uh, you know, very difficult to put it mildly. And uh, uh, often uh, North Korea is uh, portrayed uh, in the United States as the incarnation of evil, if you wish, uh, worthy of contempt uh, and blame for what have you. Uh, so the, these attempts to dehumanize uh, North Korea uh, aimed at uh, obviously uh, raising the emotional appeal, kind of mobilizing uh, the public to hate that country. Uh, this is something uh, which is, uh, presents a huge obstacle uh, to resolving the problems of uh, the Korean Peninsula. Now, uh, it doesn't really help uh, when uh, uh, you read in the press uh, virtually on a daily basis that, uh, you know, uh, there is the reign of terror uh, in Pyongyang, that political opponents are being fed to dogs or being gunned down with AAA gunfire. 
uh, in stadiums. These are the examples of the kind of uh, really destructive, uh, kind of dehumanizing uh, demonization of what's going on uh, in the enemy states of Pyongyang. Now, what are the causes of demonization? Very briefly, uh, I would uh, highlight at least three. Uh, you know, the first one, of course, is the uh, kind of government uh, uh, orchestrated, and that is psychological warfare that's going on. It's a legacy campaign, uh, basically. Uh, I can't blame only uh, the Western side for this. I mean, the North Korean government is engaged in a similar psychological warfare uh, against uh, its "quote unquote" enemies. Uh, as you know, uh, so uh, and there is probably very little we can do uh, as academics to uh, stop that, unless uh, our governments change. Uh, the strategy and policies towards each other, uh, unless we shift from uh, isolation uh, containment uh, towards engagement, unless we abandon hostile policy, hostile intent towards each other, and uh, focus on reconciliation and collaboration. Now, the second driver, uh, the second cause of this demonization uh, that's going on is uh, I, I think rooted in the uh, misinformation uh, uh, in the fake news uh, which are out there. I'll just give you an example. I mean, Kim Jong Un is dead. Uh, kind of fake news. Uh, last year alone, I mean, we had uh, uh, five or six uh, uh, instances when the whole world went into this crazy uh, soul searching. Uh, that fake news was planted on the web uh, that the leader of North Korea uh, is no longer with us. I mean, clearly it's, uh, it was fake. We, we all knew it, people who watch North Korea closely. And yet, uh, you know, it kind of set off uh, that uh, the cycle of uh, demonization all over again. Alternative facts, uh, the way facts are misinterpreted uh, so all these contribute to uh, uh, kind of uh, creating uh, the evilish uh, image uh, of uh, the North. Finally, I mean, we live in the era of the so-called post-truth, post uh, when, uh, uh, you know, uh, objective facts are less important than uh, uh, appeals to emotion, appeals to personal beliefs in shaping public opinion, and especially if some people believe that good is bad and bad is good, uh, the kind of open subversion uh, of truth. Uh, so it opens an easy uh, way to demonize uh, your opponent about which really uh, we uh, know very little and don't really want to know much uh, because we're kind of content with the knowledge we have. Uh, so, uh, what are the uh, impacts uh, of that demonization? Because I think they're significant. And the first uh, effect of uh, ongoing demonization campaign of North Korea uh, is very simple. I mean, we are pushing further away uh, the North Korean people uh, from us uh, because, I mean, nobody likes to be called evil. Nobody likes to be... Uh, demonized, if you wish, and uh, in a way we're building a wall uh, between us and uh, the North Korean people. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, this demonization, if anything, uh, kind of diminishes our understanding of North Korea. Uh, why, you know, we imposed the, the United States government imposed the travel ban. Uh, on North Korea. So nobody can travel to North Korea anymore, uh, you know, from the United States. And by the way, from other countries as well, because if they do, then when they apply for a U.S. visa, uh, these applications will be denied. So in a way, it's like secondary impact. So we no longer can travel there. Obviously, they cannot come to the United States. Uh, foreign diplomats uh, left uh, Pyongyang 
en masse because of the pandemic and they're not likely to return anytime soon. So there's much less reporting coming from uh, North Korea. Now, the United Nations uh, passed uh, uh, one of the sanctions resolutions which uh, encouraged, uh, you know, foreign uh, countries, basically various countries to reduce the size of the North Korean diplomatic missions around the world. Uh, and of course, the United States uh, doesn't want uh, the North Korean mission uh, to be uh, here, a mission to the United Nations. And so, uh, you know, there are lots of visa problems that they experience as a result. Uh, now, the North Korean social media sites uh, hosted uh, uh, in some countries, uh, uh, they're being shut down, uh, whether it's on YouTube or, uh, you know, Facebook or what have you, because they're seen as propaganda outlets. Uh, now, uh, and that all does not help uh, increase, improve our understanding uh, of North Korea. I mean, we talk about the information flows and how they can help the North Korean people learn about what's going on around the world. And yet uh, we do uh, whatever we can to restrict uh, the flows of information about North Korea into this country uh, and around the world. If anything, uh, you know, I believe that another implication of this demonization campaign, and it's the opposite side of demonization uh, in some sense, is that cult of personality in North Korea, because the more we demonize that country, the more the North Korean people feel like they need to rally around the flag and support the leaders. So, you know, if we want to, uh, if anything, I would, uh, it's a controversial idea, but I would submit to you that uh, uh, our uh, demonization campaign uh, actually helps uh, the North Korean leaders uh, to kind of cement that uh, cult uh, of the personality which exists out there. I mean, there are many reasons for uh, the cult, but uh, inadvertently uh, demonization uh, may be helping uh, them maintain it. Uh, and finally, another impact of this demonization is that, uh, in a way, it inhibits any innovation uh, in our own policymaking towards North Korea, because all of a sudden, you know, uh, anybody who advocates any changes in that policy uh, is portrayed as an advocate of uh, evil, you know, almost like a son of Satan, uh, if you wish. Uh, and once, you know, the uh, policy debate is uh, put in these terms, uh, it's really uh, not easy to overcome these moral obstacles and political uh, kind of uh, inhibitions. Now, uh, as academicians, what can we do to overcome uh, this uh, demonization? As I said, uh, again, as long as uh, the psychological warfare uh, continues, uh, there's very little academicians can do as long as we, the governments maintain the current policies. But nevertheless, beyond uh, psychological warfare, uh, you know, as academicians, uh, we, we can and we must recognize that uh, this demonization is nothing but, uh, other than part of psychological warfare, uh, a cognitive bias, if you wish. It's a particular mental model uh, that skews our perceptions of reality. Again, I visited North Korea many times. I lived there for a number of years. I graduated from Kim Il-sung University. I mean, you don't need to tell me anything uh, about North Korea, but whatever I know does not amount, does not amount uh, to any characterizations of evil uh, which I learned in, uh, you know, uh, in school and church through reading uh, holy books, if you wish. So uh, for academicians, I would encourage uh, them to apply uh, our critical thinking skills uh, to cope with it. So we need to ask the right questions. Uh, you know, we need to check our assumptions. 
uh, about that country. Uh, we need to collect uh, evidence, if you wish, uh, factual evidence, and not just uh, you know the alternative facts or uh, fake news. Uh, we need to reach out to uh, the real experts and consult with the expert opinions, uh, and not just those people who have never been to North Korea, never met a North Korean, uh, and uh, who pontificate about that country. I mean, we have uh, Dr. Trevelinger uh, on this panel, and, uh, uh, you know, he is a unique person. You know, he's the only American, I guess, uh, among the academics who actually met the Supreme Leader of North Korea. And uh, I would be, uh, you know, giving like a thousand percent, thousand times advantage to whatever he has to say about that country than anybody else who has never been there, or never, uh, you know, met a life North Korean. So we need to develop alternative explanations uh, about what's going on there, uh, check the sources, test the hypothesis uh, presented to us against the evidence and expert views. And by any means, we have to avoid politicization. Uh, just to give you a quick example, I mean, pandemic. North Koreans say they had no cases of COVID-19 uh, and they found a way. A uh, unique way, exceptional way. Nobody else in the world, uh, you know, was able uh, to do it like they did. You know, everywhere else, we dismissed it, saying, "Oh, that's uh, bogus. I mean, that's nonsense. Uh, it's uh, silly." Uh, and that's again another example of the evilish uh, behavior. You know, I would say, let's change our tactic here. Let's engage them on this and say, okay, tell us how you did it. Let's exchange some scientific delegations, medical teams. Uh, let's try to learn the lesson of you from the North Koreans. And maybe, you know, when they're confronted with the scientific inquiry like that, uh, they will adjust a little bit their line, or maybe we will learn something interesting which we do not know. Uh, so, again, but that means you need to keep an open mind. You need to uh, stop demonizing uh, that country and start exploring it and engaging. I, need, I would like to close by saying, by quoting Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize uh, winner uh, and an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, author who wrote about the Gulag. And, uh, who knows best? He knows best. He knew best about what the Gulag was all about. And whatever I see in North Korea does not even come close to uh, what we know about Gulag. And he said, and I quote here, uh, the battle line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man. And so let's leave that uh, in the heart of every man and let's not uh, politicize and demonize uh, you know, our relations uh, with North Korea. So with that, let me just express my hope, true hope that, uh, uh, you know, as we celebrate the Lunar New Year, uh, peace on earth will prevail despite uh, the U.S.-Chinese tensions, U.S.-Russian uh, confrontation and conflicts over Taiwan, Ukraine, and of course, the Korean Peninsula. And finally, I do hope, Michael, I do hope that we will all see each other in person in Korea for the World Summit uh, sooner rather than later. And I'll keep my fingers crossed on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Menzerov, for this uh, really important uh, perspective. And I'm really happy to hear your views on uh, very, very carefully thought out views on the demonization of North Korea, it has it is an important, extremely important perspective to uh, bring to the table, and um, so many uh, details here. I'd like to go over again on my notes, and thank you very much again for your your comments. And um, now I'm going to ask our two presenters uh, uh, that have set the tone for the discussion. Um, that we now hear from our talented panelists who I'd like to ask for some remarks in response to our presenters. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Akyung Pak, 
a Canadian citizen. Dr. Park was born in South Korea and migrated to Canada via Brazil in 1968 after fulfilling her high school at Seoul. She has been living in Montreal, Canada for almost 40, 40 years. Dr. Park earned her PhD in social anthropology at the Université de Laval in Quebec in 1986. Her research areas were West Sumatra, Indonesia, and Jeju in the Republic of Korea. She's published widely in France, England, and Indonesia. After having lectured at Jeju National University for 2011 to 2014, and having done field work uh, in, in 2016, she published a book on Jeju Island women's, uh, women divers in 2018. Very, very interesting subject. She left academia for a period of about 20 years, during which time she worked in the Canadian federal government with first with the immigration department and then at CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency, where she traveled the world as a, as a senior social development and gender, gender equality advisor between 1990 and 2010. I, uh, although uh, she claims to be neither a specialist on the DPRK nor on Korean politics, Dr. Park has nevertheless developed a keen interest in both these areas and has been reading and, and attending lectures on the DPRK and Korean history in the last two years. So Dr. Park, may I ask you to offer some remarks um, and at the end, would you please ask a question to one of our, our presenters, if you would. And uh, now the floor is yours, Dr. Park. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Good I morning. appreciate this um, opportunity to be part of this uh, panel. And um, I would make brief comments on two uh, speaker's presentation and um, afterwards I'll briefly talk about what I think about the issue of uh, reunification in the Korean Peninsula. First of all, um, Dr. Felix Kim, it's first time I hear about the meeting, anecdotes of a meeting between uh, President Kim Il-sung and uh, Revenue Moon. Um, I knew a little bit about uh, their meetings and this um, uh, foundation uh, created by Revenue Moon, but, uh, and I knew that he was a very fervent anti-communist at certain period, uh, but uh, you mentioned that uh, President Kim Il-sung said, why should I persecute this person who prays for the salvation of Korea. Um, and they became both patriots and like brothers. I never heard of this before, so I'm glad to know of this fact. Um, and uh, you, Dr. Kim mentioned about a vision of Korea and um, unification of Korea, he lists uh, several um, uh, items, among which peaceful association and voluntary association. This comes very close to what is um, in uh, June 15 uh, joint communication between North and South Korea which was announced in year 2000 uh, between um, between uh, the then the president, late president Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-il. And it contains five um, uh, items, but it's essentially a declaration that North and South representatives, NGOs, they all met together and agreed upon uh, what they should do, what they want to do. And this includes the notion of um, confederation and the lower um, federation. Anyway, all this links together. I'm very glad to hear um, your presentation of um, what you have been doing and um, 
um, your <clears throat> what you have been doing and um, mm, we have to leave trust and miscommunication we have to work against we have to work for the trust and miscommunication against miscommunication um i will stop there uh, my comment on um dr kim And I move on to my comment on the next speaker, or how do you want to proceed? Yes, please, please do. <clears throat> and my comment on um, Dr. Manstrop, I met him several times in these um, conferences. And this is the first time I hear uh, your um, presentation of um, your talk about demonization and your explanation, and I'm delighted to hear what you say. And um, you mentioned about uh, the need of a shift from isolation to engagement. Um, <clears throat> and um, what can we do? You ask the question. Uh, about the demonization. And I agree uh, with you that this, this is a cognitive bias and um, we need to develop critical thinking and collect evidence to counterbalance this. Um, having said that, I have a question to you. Um, you talk about um, demonization increases cult of personality. And I don't know if I really agree with this. Uh, cult of personality has its own history and its own need in this country to build their uh, sovereignty and in, um, uh, independence. And whether demon demonization has anything to do with it uh, I, we have to, um, we have to think about it. After having said that, I want to, um, as an, I'm an anthropologist, and I'm going to speak as an anthropologist, <clears throat> introducing the notion of um, we and the other. What can we do? to promote, to contribute to the uh, peace on um, Korean Peninsula. And uh, in anthropology, there is an interesting concept called ethic and emic view, which might introduce, which might contribute to this uh, mm -hmm. discussion on peace in Korean Peninsula. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, emic view refers to insider's view uh, of a society. So when we study, as an anthropologist, when I study a given society, uh, whether you apply emic view, insider's view, is different from ethic view, which is the outsider's view. So um, when you use ethic view, it's essentially you are imposing outsider's view on interpreting this given society. <laughs> to, <clears throat> um, to explain this a bit in a plain language, I would like to uh, talk about briefly my uh, first contact with North Korea. Uh, this was many, many years ago when I was a child in Korea. Uh, we were always presented with the image of um, demons, as uh, Dr. Mansurov mentioned. E even inside the Korea at that time, 
This was right after the Korean War. And um, this, uh, the, the North Koreans had demons with red face and horns. And this presentation is deeply seated in Korean psyche. And from this comes the naming of the red referring to North Koreans. And I discovered this is even true now. And I discovered in <laughs> Canada and Europe, many people hold this um, uh, image of North Korea, as Dr. Mansurov mentioned. And then I left Korea for America soon after. And I studied anthropology. As, uh, at, in my introduction, I studied many different <coughs> societies. And six years later, I became interested in North Korea and even visited North Korea a few years ago. And I discovered that they are not red-faced demons. <laughs> As I was told, they looked exactly like me and they had the same norms and etiquettes that I was raised with in South Korea. So now I'm discovering how I have been ignorant about North Korea and educating myself. How can we make peace with people who are projected to us by media and politicians as demons? I want to take an example of the most discussed topic at the moment relating to North Korea, US-led sanctions and the most recent hot issue North Korea's convention, conventional weapons threat, as it was described. <clears throat> Have we asked why North Korea keeps on testing missile weapons? According to one BBC analyst, quoting the North Korean official line, says, this test was intended to verify whether the missile system worked as it should, rather than to show off new technology or to threaten the neighboring countries. Furthermore, this test was already announced during the Eighth Party Congress in January 2022. Um, <clears throat> Kim Jong-un uh, said the development of military reconnaissance satellites and hypersonic missiles along with unmanned attack drones are the major goals of the party Congress for the next five year plan. The same analyst interprets that a surge in missile tests indicate the North Korean economic struggles under US led sanctions in North Korea. It is obvious according to the analysis of many South Korean and foreign scholars, what is most desired by North Korea are two things release of sanctions and halt to joint American North, American South Korean military exercise. Sanction is tightening more and more, threatening the survival of the North Korean population in their access to food, their <coughs> economy and security. <coughs> Sanction is a US led hostile act and violence according to North Korean view, threatening the survival of the North Korean population, especially the vulnerable population, women and children. The joint American-South Korean military exercise is taking place several times a year, which is a virtual war for North Koreans. Preparation against this military exercise drains the North Korean economy, which has to prepare against a possible attack any time. But during this time, the North Korean army's manpower is diverted to national defense from their civilian work, in example, constructions of buildings, roads, and agricultural food production. The US ambassador to the UN recently stated, we are open to the diplomatic talks with North Korea with no precondition. Our aim is to end North Korea's threatening behavior. Now, we must ask here, who is, who is threatening whom? North Korea's conventional weapons, 
or US-led sanctions threatening the survival of North Korean population. My question in ending the, this uh, intervention is, how can we bring peace to the Korean Peninsula when all parties feel threatened? Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Park, for your unique insights from the anthropological point of view. And I especially resonate with the emic and edic distinction, which I think is very relevant and helpful here and ties in very much with the idea of demonization from an edic point of view. Of course, it's difficult to get information, uh, adequate information, uh, but still it, it should be a very much our, our, our our agenda to make a great effort to do so. so. Thank you very, very much for your intervention here. And finally, I would uh, like to introduce the unique and amazing Dr. Joseph Terwilliger. His CV is uh, several meters long. So I'll share some insights and let him speak for himself. It's, uh, I found it an extremely difficult task to put Dr. Terwilliger's life journey into something resembling normalcy because uh, that's because he's lived several lives that almost never would coincide. Uh, he's impersonated Abraham Lincoln at trendy Manhattan nightclubs. He's, he has a degree in tuba performance from the Peabody Conservatory of Music and pro plays professionally in the New York area. He's a leading expert with the National Institute for Health and Welfare in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, he's traveled to the DPRK with basketball star Dennis Rodman and made movies uh, with, with him. Uh, he's also adjunct professor at Pyongyang University of Science and Technology in the DPRK. And of course, he's tenured professor in neurobiology at Columbia University in New York. So that's just, we're just getting started. Um, importantly for our purposes today, he set up an academic exchange program between scholars at Columbia University and Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. But what endears me most to him is that he got his start as a fur trapper, selling raccoon pelts and skunk essence to raise money to buy his first tuba. And uh, that's where we have something in common because my grandfather raised his family after World War I in North Canada, Northern Canada by fur trapping. <laughs> so uh, there we go. Without further ado, Dr. Terwilliger, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. You know, I've been following a lot of these uh, weekly seminar programs from UPF over the course of lockdown, and I think they've done a very good job of using the advantages of actually uh, Zoom-type communications and things on lockdown to help you know, bring people together, as Dr. Mansarov said earlier. Um, it's something I've also been trying to do. We've been running courses on critical thinking, actually, and logical reasoning in human genetics in North Africa over the course of the pandemic, because I'm stuck in my apartment, and I figured that's the only way I get to go there. We were trying to build collaborations with scientists in Libya, where I had connections um, in the past. So again, it's all, for me, it's always been about trying to find ways to use science or music or sports or art or something like that to interact with people around the world and try to build relationships when, well, governments can't because they have their own separate set of interests than we have. So, on the, you know, right now, my, for example, my largest human genetics projects are in places like Venezuela and Iran and Libya. And I worked a lot in the former Soviet Union. That's when I first got introduced to Koreans because I was doing a study of Koreans living in Kazakhstan and, uh, and in the Russian Far East, but mostly in Kazakhstan. And at the time, it was the first time I had a chance to meet North Koreans in normal life. You know, the editor of the Korean ethnic newspaper in Almaty was a North Korean expat who was working there and, you know, just seeing, starting to see these people as normal and realizing that nothing fit the stereotypes that I'd been fed by reading all the literature I could read about North Korea, most of which was written by people who have never been to North Korea, um, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, so in terms of North Korea, I've, I've taught at the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, where I 
I go there and I teach critical thinking, basically using science as an example. I think it's one of the biggest things we as academics have responsibility to do is to teach people how to think rather than just to memorize a bunch of stuff that may or may not be that important. And we don't do that enough. So especially in science, people are always like, well, memorize all these facts and I'll give you a test. When I give tests, medical students hate me because I give the test where I give them all the facts and I ask them to reason from the facts. And it's a, it's a dying art, unfortunately, in America. But in North Korea, they're actually pretty good at it. I was you know, quite impressed with their ability to do those things, aside from just the memorization that is usually taught. Now, I've also been in North Korea teaching. We taught, organized a workshop on how to write for international journals and how to build collaborations with foreign scientists. And that was done with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And as, as um, Mr. Duffy mentioned, I, I got a grant from Columbia University to do a faculty exchange and student exchange program between Columbia and Kim Il-sung University. And that was all ready to go in the summer of 2017 when all of a sudden the travel ban came into effect, preventing us from going there and preventing them from coming here. And it just reminded me as a kid, we always used to, you know, give the Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries a hard time because they wouldn't let their citizens travel. I remember the first time I met East Germans after the fall of Berlin Wall, they said, well, gee, what did we get out of this? We got freedom to travel and fruits from South America. <laughs> and in some sense, now we're becoming what we used to not like, right? We're the ones that are banning freedom of movement. And you know, I've been to a few of these uh, UPF seminars in recent weeks, and everybody keeps asking, is North Korea changing? Is North Korea becoming more like us? And I'll say that if you'd have told me in 2019 that we were living the way we're living today, I would not have believed you. But think about it. We've become more like them, more than you could ever imagine. We now are the ones issuing travel bans. If I want to go to a restaurant, I have to show my papers, right, to prove I'm vaccinated. Um, we had people locked in their apartments in Italy in the spring of 2020 when COVID hit because, well, we thought lockdown is the only way to deal with the pandemic. And by the way, North Korea showed that if you do lock down 100 percent, it does work. Right. Because if they actually had a big COVID problem, there's no way they would be able to hide that, at least in their domestic media. I mean, if you watch the you know, North Korean uh, television, which I, I do pretty regularly, you see that they every day they show pictures of the modern, developed Western world where people are waiting online to get COVID tests and going to the emergency room. They say, aren't you glad you live here where we don't have this problem? Well, in the name of COVID, we turned into, in many ways, something much more similar to North Korea. And I would argue China is moving that direction, Russia, every, the whole world is becoming more like them. So they're just sitting there saying, hey, we'll just wait a little while and pretty soon we won't have to change. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, think about it. I, I never would have believed that it would be impossible in America to watch a football game without seeing political slogans everywhere on the field and on people's helmets. Our media is now largely voice of a party, right? It's Rodong Shimun. It's like yes. each... Each media outlet represents their team and they want people to all think the same things and not actually engage in critical thinking. The demonization that Alexander talked about is not just us demonizing North Korea, it's Democrats and Republicans demonizing each other when their real argument is over which 10% of the population gets a little tax cut. You know? um, so it worries me. And then we now have these calls for censorship of foreign news and disinformation and what is disinformation except whatever the government doesn't want you to read or whatever they disagree with? And I don't think I think the whole purpose of America was that we don't want the government telling us what's true and what's not true. We want to be able to think for ourselves. And we as academics are the ones that are in the position to teach that and to emphasize that and to say, look, you should read everything. When I was a kid. I used to listen to shortwave radio all the time because I thought it was fascinating to listen to things like. Radio Moscow or Radio Pyongyang. And then I'd write them letters and they'd send me tons and tons of propaganda. And I read propaganda all the time and it didn't turn me into a communist. You know, I'm a libertarian. I'm the opposite of a communist. But the fact is I learned a lot about how they think. And I think that's important. 
You know, we're demonizing this whole idea of China trying to influence us through Confucius Institutes and things like that. But I think that's a good thing because I'd like our future, you know, diplomats and scholars in foreign relations to understand what China thinks and what better way to learn it than to have them teach it. I mean, we go around the world teaching our system. Shouldn't we be doing it the other way around as well? I mean, again, the best class I ever had when I was in school was one where we were given a set of 20 scientific papers each week, all published in the top journals, all by scientists at the best universities, and all of which were wrong. And every student's job was to find out what's wrong in this paper written by a real expert from a real university, you know, in a major journal. And that really teaches you to question everything and be critical. And, you know, and that's what America was always about. That's the whole idea of the First Amendment, right? Win in the marketplace of ideas. So I think as academics, we first need to fix our own house, stop the demonization here, and be the example we used to be to other countries, where other, other people used to come here and say, wow, this is great. People are free. They can say whatever they want, and they don't hate each other, and there's no fighting. And today, it's not really like that. So it, it worries me. And I think that as a first step to trying to think about building a good relationship with places like North Korea... You know, when I go there, I try to be an ambassador for America and try to represent us well and change how they think about us. But today, you know, when you talk to them, they'll ask questions like, well, what about this? What about that? How come you have political slogans in your stadiums? Or why are you guys demonizing each other? And why are you banning our media? And it, it, it makes it very hard to take the high road. So I think this is something that as an academic community, we actually are in the position to control. Even though we can't go there now, we can at least try to change our own selves and teach, re-emphasize critical thinking like Alexander said. And I mean, Alexander grew up where, you know, it was kind of similar. It's, we're becoming more similar to the country that you grew up in. And I, I'd like to hear your comment on, on that as well, just how America has been changing when we all keep talking about how to get them to change. So that's basically what I wanted to say when I thought about this, you know, the bottom line is if we become what they are in order to, you know, I mean, then we've already lost. We basically lost the war when we become what we used to stand up against. Thank you, Dr. Terwilliger. That's uh, really well put. I, I would say we've, we're, uh, to paraphrase, we're becoming what we, what we fear. Yeah, mm -hmm. voluntarily. Uh, Voluntarily, yeah, without any any prompting from outside. So, you know, that's a double double jeopardy. So, uh, perhaps now we can uh, go into interaction among the panel panelists and speakers just freely. Uh, uh, anyone who wants to speak, uh, Dr. Kim, I recognize you here. There, please, please, Dr. Kim. Я тут начну на сперва еще раз поздравить, поздороваюсь. Здравствуй, Александр. Много да, добрый день. Как мы с тобой видели. Да, добрый день, доктор. Вот. Ну, я, пожалуй, начну с той фразы, которую ты мне сказал лет девять назад. Кто платит, тот танцует. Вам платят, вы танцуете. Я, я сейчас скажу. Потому Правильно. что... Много наворочено, понимаете? Вы между истиной и догадками, но основное вы скрываете. Это Александр. Вы где это видели, что ковид это есть, нет? Дело в том, что КНДР имеет всего две границы. Китай и Россия. И когда только разведка, разведка КНД э, о китайском вирусе доложила, Ким Чен Ын моментально перекрыл границу. И все. КНД ковида нет. Это я действительно не то, что с подачи, я это чувствую, знаю. Я сам доктор медицины. Понимаете? Санитарная эпидемия кордона играет наиважнейшую роль э, при прерывании пандемии. Вы вспомните времена Ивана Грозного, когда в Европе бушевали 
Черная смерть, чума, холера. А несмотря на это, Иван Грозный двухнедельные кордонные лагеря построил вдоль границ. И Россия избежала этих пандемий. Вы же помните это. Поэтому не надо это говорить. А о культе личности не надо путать это с любовью народа. Вы сами окончили университет Ким Ир Зена. Разница большая между культом личности и любовью народа к своим вождям. Вы это что-то путаете. В Корее нет культа личности. Там есть любовь к своим вождям. И это я утверждаю, потому что сам когда-то в девятом году я, не, в конце 2008 года, оскорбил посла КНДР, заявив тем, что, что я не люблю ходить под конвоем. Что вы можете мне показать, мол, за три дня? И когда доложили об этом Ким Чен Иру, он пригласил меня на, с моими друзьями на день рождения на 12 дней. И вот благодаря этому у меня открылись глаза. Я ходил туда, куда хотел. И во сколько хотел. Без гидов. Я знакомился с людьми. И вот туда мне пришла вера, что у них своя жизнь, что культа нет, что это любовь народа. Это большая разница. Вот. Мне отрадно было бы слушать госпожу Пак, потому что в Германии, в Германии президент Ассоциации корейцев Европы, профессор Ли Кисук, названная моя сестра, мы с ней как-то сошлись о том, что справедливости. Она сама тоже в Южной Корее выросла, все ее братья и сестры сейчас в Америке живут. Но вот она без всяких как-то вот э, пропаганды, что ли, прониклась идеями и чучхе, и это и такое. И самое главное, о чести и достоинстве э, нашей нации. Вы посмотрите, что американцы сделали с нашей молодежью в Южной Корее. Что? Они привели так называемый их менталитет жизни, их ценности жизни. И что? У нашей молодежи в Южной Корее пропало будущее. Они занимают первое место по самоубийству. Они привели себе геи в проституции. Это что, неправда? Это истина. Я, корейский язык в Южной Корее за мусорен. И хорошо, вот сейчас соглашение пришло о восстановлении родного языка. И между Северным и Югом создалась комиссия о восстановлении языка. Это много, много чего дает. А Америка, ну, в свое время наша организация в России, в Москве, четыре международные конференции большие э, провела по вопросам восстановления, мир, мирного восстановления, объединения Кореи. Приезжали диаспоры с Австралии, с Америки, Японии. Очень много диаспоры, очень много прогрессивных людей э, хотят помочь объединиться в Корее. И несмотря на это, правительство вот, Америки издало тот закон, о котором вы сказали. Это, о том, что кто едет э, в Северную Корею, 10 лет уже не имеет будет права получать визу в другие страны. Доктор Ким, у меня много кое-что много говорить, так что Ким, я like рад за то, что вы проводите такую очень нужную конференцию, даете нам общаться э, друг с другом, истину говорить. Спасибо. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I'd like to ask Sasha if you'd like to respond to to uh, Dr. Kim briefly. No, I mean, we are running out of time, so I, I just like to say that I agree completely with uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Terwillinger's uh, point that, uh, unfortunately, uh, America is becoming a lot like North Korea, but because this session is recorded, uh, and, you know, I have to follow my instincts here, and uh, since the you know, space uh, of freedom is uh, shrinking in this country and the freedom of speech is uh, uh, no longer kind of uh, upheld uh, in this country. You know, I have to be mindful uh, of, uh, you know, my job, my livelihood. 
So basically, I agree, Joe, with you completely. America is different today from what it was uh, many years ago when I came here. And uh, we no longer feel, uh, you know, comfortable discussing things the way they appear to many of us because of that fear of repercussions uh, which are likely to follow. And so we need to fix our house first here before we go out and uh, mentor and tell other people uh, what needs to be done uh, over there. So again, I don't want to steal any more time. I know you have to finish it, Mr. Chairman, so please do. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Mansurov. I'd just like to ask uh, Dr. Pak and then Dr. Terwilliger to uh, give us a wrap up uh, comment in about a minute, a minute and a half each. Thank you, Dr. Pak. Um, uh, Dr. Kim mentioned that in, he would like to say to the Americans, it is good to be guest in Korea, but um, better go back home. <laughs> uh, I think this is the view of many Koreans in South and North and um, it's first time I hear from people outside. I don't know much about Korean community in, in, in Moscow. And uh, uh, it is interesting to hear any, anyway from uh, that part of the world, the same view. And the Korea is very big, it's all over the world. And um, uh, this is essentially what I'm saying and many Koreans in North and South are saying. Thank you. Thank Roger, you. if I can make just a quick point, uh, the United States uh, was invited by the government of the Republic of Korea uh, to come. Uh, we are not there against the will of the Korean people. If anything, we are there uh, as part of the U.S. Rock Alliance helping uh, the Republic of Korea defend its national interests on the peninsula. Uh, and the moment the South Korean government tells us to go home, well, it's not it's not it's not so we just need to make sure that uh, you know, the record is straight. И где это видно, что командование южнокорейской армии принадлежит американцам. Президент Трамп, ваш президент, на весь мир объявил, готов 20 миллионов уничтожить. И послал к берегам Северной Кореи три авианосных группы. Где они? Надо быть честным. В первую очередь перед собой будь честным. Okay, good. Let, let's have Dr. Terwilliger's last uh, last remarks, and then we have to close the session. So, Dr. Joe, it's yours. Up to you. I mean, to me, the basic point of both Dr. Kim and Dr. Mansarov's talks, as well as ours, was that uh, you have to think for yourself, and you have to listen to people, and don't believe what you read. Because most of what I've read about North Korea is not what I experienced when I've been there. Most of what I read about the Soviet Union was not what I experienced when I went there. I went there with my college orchestra in 1987. And, you know, we played in Leningrad and in Moscow. I mean, the thing is that it's so easy to have disinformation. We all hear about it every day. But North Korea is the king of fake news. I mean, everything we know about North Korea is mostly nonsense. Like, I, I don't trust anything I would read anywhere without talking to someone, mostly Dr. Mansarov, because he knows a lot about it. And He's one of my favorite people to talk to about this subject because he knows so much and has a good way of thinking about it. But the bottom line is, like I tell my students in genetics, you're ready to graduate when you're telling me I'm wrong and you're right about it. And that's what it should always be the goal of every teacher to have your students tell you you're wrong and to question everything and to not believe anything just because it's written. And it, that's where we are today. Okay, with that, with that sage advice, uh, we'll have to wrap up our session. Uh, thanks to our technical director, Mrs. Kaylee Moffat, who guided us through our, our perilous journey, uh, technical journey, um, as well as interpreters, uh, Maria Nazarovra, 
uh, Konstantin Kirillov and Dmitry Samko for Russian, Pierre Beauregard for French. And thanks to all of uh, the audience who participated. And of course, to our wonderful speakers and panelists, we're so grateful that you could join us and add your wisdom to our, our exchanges today and uh, to our, our project basically for the reunification of Korea. And uh, we have sessions th this afternoon, continuing actually one at 11 this morning, within an hour on the, with the women's leaders leverage on peace building. And also on this afternoon where Dr. Joe will be uh, featured again in the art and culture in action as a pathway to harmony session at 1 p.m. Eastern time, 9 p.m. Moscow. So with that, I thank you so much, all of you. Uh, be well, stay safe. COVID free and uh, uh, engage in free speech wherever you can. And let's re re recapture the high ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, for academ with, with academicians at the forefront. Okay. God thank, bless you. You. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. Good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Есть мечта, что встретиться вживую.